I'm really grateful that you invited me, especially at this time, uh, during this particular celebration of these 100 years. And for all of the you who have not been to the exhibition, I suggest that you go. We had a private tour last night, uh, the opening, so to speak, in a way, right? It's an amazing exhibition. And for all you young people here, I think we often forget that whatever we do, we build on the work of our forefathers. And uh, sometimes people forget about this and they double up and they repeat things that shouldn't be repeated. So I really suggest you go and you learn about what has been done before. I can see some young people in the back there. So <laughs> I'm talking to you guys. Okay, but um, to my talk, and it's a little bit related uh, to you know history and also to what people have done in the past. Um, Diana's right, I have just moved. Uh, I've actually only been to, in, in my new place for about one month and before I, uh, you know, then came here um, and I've been to other conferences in between, so I haven't actually been at my place that many, uh, for that many times. Um, but it's this place here. It's a, a Fachhochschule, which is a, a University of Applied Sciences and Arts, and my department is mainly biomedical engineering. And what you see here is this, is this is our building, and there's a lot of green around. You know, it's in the middle of Dortmund, which is a big city, but there's a lot of green around the place, which makes it very nice. Uh, the other advantage that we have is uh, we have the hospital sitting right there, and I'm really hoping to be building up some collaborations with this hospital and also with uh, Professor Nietzsche, who you've just heard, who's also in Dortmund. So let's see how it goes. I will keep you updated. But to my talk, uh, I'm going to talk about neuroplasticity in humans but I want to be a little bit more specific. And uh, in particular, I will talk about the development of, of an intervention that we are now using in the hospital quite frequently. But before I do, a little bit of background information for you, because maybe especially you young people don't realize this, but if we take a look at neurological disease and specifically at stroke, this is the kind of a pie graph um, you know, of, of costs that are incurred for various reasons. I mean, this could be because of the immediate care or because of hours lost from work. Just for stroke alone, it's about 45 billion euros per year that is spent, which is a huge amount of money. Um, and in 2030, because we heard before, you know, we are getting older, you know, the average age in Belgrade has doubled, right, since 30 years, 50 years. So, uh, you know, we're going to be a lot more old people like me who might be suffering from a stroke. So this is going to increase this number. Um, and that's a little bit scary because, uh, you know, we, we just don't have the, the, well, the possibilities to rehabilitate everybody. So we need new technologies. We need to develop new technologies to help in the hospitals. Already now, carers are becoming less and less and less. Um, you know, we're importing people from other countries uh, in Denmark or in Germany to help with some of these sick people. And this is just no longer feasible. We need to have new technologies that can take care of this. Another thing that comes to mind uh, that's a little bit scary in my view is um, if we have a look at something that we call the proportional recovery rule. This is not my idea. This is from a colleague in the States uh, who predicted this. And let me explain this to you. Let's say that uh, this is 100% of motor function. And this can be walking function as an example. And let's say that you've just had a stroke. And let's say that your function has decreased to about, I don't know, 40% or something, right? So in reality, what you have is you have a goal of reaching this 100%, right? Which means you actually have a potential that is about this much. Right? That's your potential for recovery. That is what you want. You want to get back to this 100% again. But let's look at reality. Let, let's look at what actually happens in patients worldwide. So if this is our pre-level again, about the 40%, then we only reach about 70% of our potential, so of this goal. That is what we, what we need, basically. And I find that very scary. And it doesn't matter what kind of therapy you do or if you don't do any kind of therapy, this is what we're dealing with in our patients. And there are some exceptions. Some patients with very severe stroke, they do not follow this rule. They don't really recover that much at all. But in most cases, 70% is what we're stuck with. So we need to do something about it. And what do we do about it? Well, one of the things, the key elements, also for all of you, you young biomedical engineers in here, um, one of the things that we need to remember is that we are not alone, you know, I mean, we, we, we need perspectives from different, you know, we need to look at things from different perspectives. So one of the things is we need to know the basic neuroscience. If we want to rehabilitate someone, what do we need to do? 
with this person? What, how do we learn? I mean, we've heard some things about learning, about memory, but how, in fact, does that happen? Even as an engineer, you need to know that. Um, then, of course, we need to develop the technology, and I think here, Belgrade, uh, I mean, they are amazing with the technology that we hear about, and some of the things that I see in the labs are just crazy wild, what you are able to do here. Um, and then another really, really important factor that we often forget, especially when we start to develop something as engineers, is the transfer into the clinical or the home setting. We forget to talk to the patients, we forget to talk to the caregivers, we forget to talk to the doctors who are going to be implementing what we are developing. And that can be a real issue. So, so from this perspective, what I want to talk to you about is something that I have uh, developed with a lot of collaborators, a lot of individuals that I've worked together with, and that is a brain-computer interface, and the brain-computer interface to restore motor function. Now, for those of you who do not know what this is, basically in a brain-computer interface, you record signals from the brain, and this can be invasive, it can be non-invasive. And uh, once you require those signals, you acquire them, you do some extraction of specific features, and those features are then implemented in into some kind of control of external devices, and you can actually implement a brain-computer interface to restore function or to re even to replace, you know, to drive a wheelchair, for example, for many different purposes. And what we had, what our vision was, is to develop a brain-computer interface where we associate the user's intent, either the imagination or the attempt to perform a movement, like reaching, we saw a lot about reaching before, or maybe even walking, with the artificial reproduction of this, right? So basically what we want to do in our restoration is we we want to drive either a robotic device or an electrical stimulator to be able to give that person the ability to function normally. So they imagine something or they attempt to do something, they cannot fully do it, so we help them along with our technology. That's really the intention. But this is the dream, right? And before this dream can become reality, and I can tell you I've worked on this for probably about the last 12 years, before this dream can become a reality, we have to understand, like I said before, the basic neuroscience. So in other words, relearning of lost motor skills following something like a stroke, um, or you know, when you want to do walking or even grasping, we need to follow these principles of learning and memory formation. So what exactly are these mechanisms? And this here is where a little link comes to, you know, the whole idea of why we're holding this conference. Have you ever heard this phrase? Hands up, who has heard this phrase? Cells that fire together, wire together. You students? Yeah, <laughs> only one? Go on, ah, I see some slowly putting up their hand. So basically when you learn something, when you want to induce plasticity, you have to ensure that the cells that fire together that they do fire together, only then will they wire together, otherwise it's not going to happen. That is a basic principle that we know about in memory formation and learning. So when you hear this sentence, everybody, including myself until recently, has always thought of one young gentleman called Donald Olding Hebb, who in 1949 actually, you know, kind of phrased, uh, you know, coined this phrase. Well, just very recently, and this is where you know this 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 link comes in. I talked to one of the individuals who originally worked with long-term potentiation, which is basically testing this in animal preparations in individual neuronal structures. And this guy was Tej Lumu, who's now something like 80 years old, a fantastic person. We've had a lot of email contact, and he told me, Nasali, he said. It was not Donald Olding Hebb who just, you know, why we did this work on LTP and LTD. In fact, we never even knew about this guy. Uh, we developed long-term potentiation, long-term depression all on our own. And only later on, people started to say, oh, this is like Donald Olding Hebb. So, you know, everybody quotes Donald Olding Hebb and kind of forgets about this guy and Tim Bliss, who were actually the founders of long-term potentiation and long-term depressions, who actually proved that cells that fire together do wire together. So really interesting, uh, you know, that you need to look at your history in order to understand uh, how things actually have developed. And there's a really fantastic um, review paper that Tesh wrote in 2018 uh, that actually, actually tells the story of how long-term depression and long-term potentiation were discovered and what has been done since. So it's really interesting. But enough of the history. So we know we require cells to fire together in order for them to wire together. And that's how we relearn this motor skill. So this is great in animal preparations. You can take out neuronal structures. You can stimulate one neuron and you can record from the other and you can you know, stimulate another neuron and record from that structure as well. You can do everything invasively. It's great, fantastic. 
But you know, if, as a human, you're probably not going to allow me to take out part of your brain so I can test out this theory on you, whether this really does work like this for motor learning. So some other way had to come along for us to test this non-invasively in humans. And lucky for us uh, at the University of Rostock, Katja Stefan, Joseph Klassen, they came along and they developed a protocol called paired associative stimulation. And this is still the basic neuroscience before we come to our brain-computer interface. Now, what is PAS, this paired associative stimulation? Basically, what you do is you stimulate a nerve that innervates our target muscle. In our case, we want to reactivate the tibialis anterior muscle. So what we do is we stimulate that nerve. We wait for that signal to go up to the brain because that signal will travel up to the brain, to the sensory cortex and the motor cortex. And at the precise time when it reaches the motor cortex, we give a stimulation with TMS. And we've just heard something about TMS. So we combine basically two different stimuli together, a peripheral stimulation and a central stimulation, and we do this continuously, but the timing has to be perfect, meaning only if those two signals come together at the level of the motor cortex do you see changes in the excitability of that area of the brain that is responsible for your muscle. In other words, you can stimulate the brain area before, record from the muscle, get a small response. If you do the intervention enough uh, times, so if you do enough repetitions, in our case 360, then afterwards you get a much bigger response for the same type of stimulation. So it's really great. There's a fantastic review published only recently about all the different techniques on this. Okay, great. So um, it was at this time when, uh, just before we, we decided to actually try this out to see whether we can apply it to leg muscles, where this young gentleman here, Thomas Sinkia, uh, from Auburn University, he's, he was my PhD supervisor, um, he allowed me to move to New Zealand when I was about two and a bit years uh, through my PhD because my husband was going there. So he said, okay, you can go along, but just make sure you keep writing your articles. I said, yes, of course I will, Thomas, I will do that. Yeah, of course you don't because you have so many other things you do as life sometimes happens. So Thomas decided to go from um, Denmark to visit me in New Zealand. And uh, he came for about three months. He, we were in the lab and we actually developed this past study to see whether we could make the same protocol that they had developed in Rostock, whether we could make that work for tibialis anterior so that we could allow patients to raise their foot up again, right? because that's a problem that they often have. So the way that you do this is you, um, first of all, you apply TMS alone to the area of the brain that is responsible for your tibialis anterior muscle. This is a motor evoked potential stimulation artifact here. You look at this before hand, you do your intervention, then you look at it again and you hopefully have a much bigger motor work potential. And lo and behold, we do. It's fantastic. It works. It's great. We have these increases in excitability. But we have a problem. It's still not a BCI, is it? And it's still kind of a little bit artificial because you have to have this TMS stimulation and a lot of the stroke patients don't want you to stimulate their brain. They've just had a stroke, you know? I mean, who wants to have their brain stimulated when they've just had a stroke? It's, I mean, TDCS is much nicer. It's much lower intensity, but TMS is not so nice. So we thought, okay, can we replace this TMS stimulation that's not so nice with something that is more natural, so a more natural activation of the motor cortex. And lucky for me at that time, my time in New Zealand was up and um, I came back to Denmark. And in Denmark, I met this young gentleman, Dario Farina. And Dario, he was first of all in Denmark and then he moved to Göttingen and then he moved to the UK, to London. So he's been moving around a lot, but we've still collaborated all this time. And he said to me, Natalie, how about instead of using this TMS stimulation, what we do instead is we apply or we use this natural activation when someone performs a movement. So if I had a house on you with electrodes and you were going to reach for a nice glass of a glass of wine, you know, it's Friday, or maybe a nice cold glass of beer, then I would be able to tell you about two seconds before you're going to do it that you're going to do it because we have something that we call a movement-related cortical potential, which is what you see here. And Professor Ina Taka, who is going to speak after me, she's actually one of the world leading experts on these types of signals, which we also call the Bereitschafts potential. She's worked quite intensively with it. So we thought, can we maybe use this? this signal here instead of this big whack on the head when you do TMS stimulation. So what we did in many different studies, we replaced 
the TMS with this, but of course, many, many studies followed because first of all, we had to understand when we stimulate here, how do we get the cells to fire together? In other words, at which point in this MRCP should we apply our stimulation? So where should this sensory feedback from this stimulation arrive? Should it arrive here or somewhere here or somewhere here so that the cells would actually fire together? Hmm? So that was a bit of a problem, but we managed to do it in several publications. And we found that only if you time the stimulation to arrive at the level of this negativity, do you get increases in this excitability. Wonderful, fine. So now we thought we're ready. We're gonna have our brain-computer interface because a brain-computer interface is, as you know, recording brain signals, mm? extracting some features, which in our case is the MRCP, and then using that to drive an electrical stimulator. And the really cool thing about this MRCP is that you can detect it before this peak negativity. So we could still use that signal as a way to control our electrical stimulator to provide this stimulation here. And this is kind of what our system looks like. So we have a person sitting in a chair, they're trying to imagine this dorsiflexion movement. They're looking at a screen where they have a cue that they follow. And uh, as they follow that cue, they attempt to do this dorsiflexion on this upward going ramp. They, you know, they're up the foot as much as they can. Some can't at all because they're completely paralyzed. And when we stimulate the perineal nerve at the right time so that the afferent feedback arrives at the brain during this peak negativity. We've done many publications on this, but now, and it worked beautifully in healthy individuals, but right now we thought, okay, what about in patients? What are we gonna do here? So then what came along, actually what had been along a long, long time, because I've known you since 1999, is our denmark Serbia connection. So I talked to Diane who was in Denmark, and he's been all over the world, so I didn't put in all the circles for him because it would just be a big yellow kind of, you know, map. Um, and he made a connection for me to Belgrade, and I will be forever grateful to that. Thank you. And the connection was, of course, to Professor Vladimir Kostic, who is sitting in the audience as well. And he, of course, was the head of the hospital um, where I was, was doing the work. And he allowed me to work with these patients for four something, six weeks. We actually had a student here beforehand. And he was so kind. And I will be forever grateful to this because without this and the first showing and how well this works in patients, we would have never been able to go on and be where we are now. So thank you to that. Uh, so what we did, in fact, I mean, this is the clinical setting here, and this is one example of now another hospital that I worked in, but we had to consider many factors when we then moved into the clinic. So we ha here we have this drawing, you know, we've been through the basic science, we've developed our technology, but now we have to transfer into the clinic. And there are often things as engineers that we forget about the clinic. For example, how much time do we have with each patient? And if they're in the chronic stage, of course we have more time, but if they're in the acute or subacute phase, we only have a very small window. We have half an hour per day. Maybe if we're lucky, three times a week. So which means everything has to be done within a very, very short period of time. Putting on the electrodes and doing all the tests that we have to do has to be done in a short time. And uh, the scheduling of patients, you know, when I've been doing this in, in, I mean, here it was so much nicer. When I was been doing it in, in a hospital in Denmark, the first thing is a therapist came to me and said, you want our patients? Mwah, 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 mwah. You are not going to get our patients so much. There's no way. They have to do so many other more important things than try out your technology. Uh, so you really had to fight with them. At the very beginning, it was impossible. We were getting the patients like at eight o'clock in the evening or at seven o'clock in the morning. And it was hell for us researchers to go in and to test at this time because the hospital is located like, you know, a half hour drive away and you have to lug all your equipment there. But when they started seeing that it works after the first three or four patients, they started to come into the lab knocking on the door and saying, uh, Natalie, can, can we just come have a look at what you do here? And then they started having a look and then they said, you know, I might have this patient that you could really, really use. Is it okay if we bring them to you? And all of a sudden we had so many more patients we couldn't even handle them all. So, but we really had to, to fight with the therapist because you know, the, the, the patients are like their little children. You know, they don't want to let them go because they, it, they, you know, they need to take care of them, of course. Um, the other thing, of course, that you have in a hospital is environmental noise. And I remember being in the hospital and this has happened in every hospital in Belgrade here in Bonuslo, you know, where you would be sitting there and you would be doing your experiment with a patient and all of a sudden there will be a knock on the door and there'll be someone saying, hey, Erwin, how is it going, you know? Uh, shall we have a coffee later on when you finish with this here? And it's like, 
We're recording EEG. <laughs> so it's crazy, really, what, these, uh, what happens. But this happens, and you have to deal with this because it is a natural environment. So you have to try and construct your equipment or your devices around this. It has to be able to cope with things like this. So in any case, so just really quickly, because I know I'm going to talk too much, um, the first proof of concept study was, of course, done here in Belgrade. And um, we had 22 chronic stroke patients, and we had two different groups, one that we called our BCI group and another one that we called our sham group and we tested them in only three sessions that's important to know three sessions in one week that's all we had them for and you'll be amazed at the results but the two different groups so we had two groups one group this is the MRCP which we call the BCI associative group we timed this electrical stimulation to arrive at peak negativity so we really had cells that fire together wire together we had stronger connections that we were building then the other group, this non-associative group, um, they had the stimulation, so it would arrive anytime here or anytime there, completely randomized. And the patients who were part of this group, they did not like this intervention. You know, they, they felt that they were getting worse. And in fact, I think some of them were getting slightly worse. Uh, so it was a really shock to us. Oh, I hope we're not doing anything bad to these patients. But let's take a look at the results and then I'll show you how we changed this sham group because you always need a control group. You need a sham group, otherwise you don't know whether the effects are because of what you do or just because they have joined your experiment, right? Because that can happen too. So um, if we have a look at now at the results, and I'll just explain this to you. This is the intensity of stimulation of the brain. This is a before, after, and 30 minute after measurement. So we stimulate the brain and we just record the signal size. And uh, this is the size of the signal that I showed you before, this motor evoked potential that you record from the muscle. So typically what happens is as you increase the intensity of stimulation, you also have this increase in the size of this motor evoked potential. And that's typical, that's normal, this is what we expect. But after our intervention, which only lasted a very short time, only 30 stimulations, combinations were done basically of this MRCP and this electrical stimulation. Look at the effects here. This is the open circles. Immediately after we stopped, the increases were phenomenal. And what's really important, and Professor Nietzsche just pointed to this, the effects should outlast the stimulation period by a longer time, preferably by two hours, 24 hours, a few days. So what we did is we had the opportunity to test 30 minutes after, and this is what you see in these open triangles, and they, they stayed increased. And you think, whoo, yay, it's a motor evoked potential. What's that going to do? But let's take a look at the functional changes because I think we were very impressed with the functional changes. So this is an example of a patient who did the 10 meter walk test. Before he walked the 10 meters in 15.5 seconds, after only three times coming to this intervention, this is a chronic stroke patient, it was 10.5 seconds. It was an increase by five seconds, that was phenomenal. Foot tapping frequency is something that we did together with Milica, uh, and I can't pronounce her surname, Milica. Thank you very much. Um, she has been kind enough to come and to do these experiments with us because she developed some devices for, foot, uh, for tapping frequencies. So we had a look at foot tapping frequency, and you can see the increase in this from pre to post by more than one hertz. They became faster. But this, and this is really important, you see finger tapping frequency did not change. But remember, we were not targeting fingers, we were targeting leg. We didn't, we didn't do anything for the fingers. So that did not change. So this was such an impressive difference. And if we now take a look at the uh, patient in the, non, in the sham group, in the control group, this is what we see. We don't really see increases. If anything, we see decreases, because closed is always pre, we see decreases in excitability. And if we have a look at the functional changes, look at this, no change. Foot tapping frequency, if anything, this patient became slower. And finger tapping frequency, no change. So this study that we did here in Belgrade with Professor Kostic was groundbreaking. It was so important. And we had such a difficult time publishing this. Uh, it was amazing. It took us, I think, two years to publish. And then finally, it was published in the Journal of Neurophysiology. And it's been, it's been actually cited so many times now. And everybody wants to know about the study. So, so it, it's, it was really great. So we decided, OK, we've done this in the chronic patients. Now let's see if we can make the same work in subacute patients in a different group that have more room to actually improve. So what we did here is exactly the same thing. 
um, except we had 24. We had uh, two groups again, BCI and sham. And this time the sham group was different. Remember I told you that the sham uh, people, the sham patients did not like it because we were randomizing the stimulation. Well, this time what we decided to do was to stimulate still so that the signal would be in time with this peak negativity. But the intensity of stimulation of the peripheral stimulation was so low that you would not get any feedback going up to the brain. Right? It was just kept very, very low. But they could still sense it. They could still see that they were getting stimulated. So they believed they were getting stimulation, but in fact, they were not. Um, we had these people, these 24 patients, three times a week for four weeks. And every time it lasted for about 20 minutes, half an hour, the intervention. But this is with everything, putting on the cap, the whole lot. Um, okay, what did we find here? Uh, actually, let me show you a video of this because I actually have a video for this one. Uh, this is one of my... He's one of my favorite patients up in Bronislaw. Um, his name is, uh, is Preben, and he's a big, big ACDC fan, you know, and I'm from Perth originally. <laughs> so ACDC comes from there. So, and he was actually very, very upset when he got this stroke because he had tickets to go see ACDC and he couldn't see them, damn it. So he was working really hard to be able to see them again. But Preben, um, if you just have a look at what this kind of session looks like, so you, can, you will see that he's attempting to do this. He can do it, but not very well. No? So he's actually attempting to do one. We had some patients completely paralyzed. He has a screen in front of him. He has a cap on. We only have about nine electrodes on this. And you can see there's some recordings going on here. So he's just sitting there really comfortable. I mean, it's a, you, yeah, it's a comfortable chair. Huh? They like coming to us. Um, but one thing that you will see in the next video is uh, if this one stops. And this is Andrew, by the way. He's one of my postdocs, amazing guy. And if, if he wouldn't be around, you know, I would be lost. He's, he organizes me in my time. Uh, this is Preben again, and you can see the head movement here, right? His head is moving quite a bit. This was posed a lot of problems for our BCI development because if you have big movement artifacts, your signal is tiny, it's in microvolts, right? And uh, any cable movement is going to be in the range of millivolts, so we have a real issue. So we need wireless <laughs> as the next step, actually. I think you guys are developing, you have developed this wireless system, right? I need to try this out. Okay, so. Um, but let's have a look at the results. Um, so this is uh, a patient um, out of the real group, the BCI group, and again, the same graph. This is before, the open circles are after, the open triangles are 30 minutes afterwards. These are the, uh, this is a 10 meter walk test. You can see it's amazing the progress he's made, more than three seconds. The low extremity of Hugo Meyer score, that's one of the clinical scales that they use, which we also used here in Belgrade, and we used it again there. He improved a score from 24 out of 34 beforehand to 33 out of 34 afterwards. And that's really, really impressive. Now, I hope, though, that you are all still so awake that you will say to me, well, hey, hang on a second. These are subacute patients. Of course they're going to improve because they have spontaneous biological recovery. So this is nothing special, what you're telling us here. Of course they're going to improve. Well, of course I have an answer for you <laughs> because we compared the sham group to the BCI group and we found, of course, both groups improve. So this is now the low extremity of Hugo Meyer score. So you have before and afterwards in the BCI group and before and afterwards in the sham group. Both improve, as you can see, but if you look at the difference, pre-post difference between the BCI and sham group, the BCI group improved by probably about three, four points more on the fugal mice scale, which is clinically significant, than did the BCI sham group. So we were incredibly happy and also all the people in the hospital were really, really happy and they want us to be there permanently and they keep giving us patients and we just don't have the time or the manpower to deal with it. But one important question remains and I'm almost, I'm just done, almost done. That's oh, okay. I talk too much. One important question remains and I keep getting asked this also by some journalists in, in Denmark. What do we do differently to the therapists? What do we do differently? And this is where you, you guys should really, uh, the engineers should really open up uh, your ears because my answer to this is we do everything exactly the same as the therapist. The therapist will do exactly the same. They will try to move the foot of the patient as the patient attempts to do it. But one advantage that we have is we have the technology to time things so good that cells that wire together fire, sorry, the cells that fire together wire together because our cells are then firing together. 
right? Because we can time things so much better. That is the exception. So the technology aspect, we're doing things the same, but the technology aspect here is very important. Okay, so just uh, really quickly, we have these, uh, um, the threefold user, and that's always a challenge whenever you build new technologies and, and build new interventions. You must understand the basic neuroscience. You must, otherwise there's no point in doing anything. And this is, I think, what uh, Tomovich did all the time, right? I mean, this is something that, that he was always a good uh, uh, proponent for. Um, you need, of course, the, oops, the development of a technology um, and this comes by knowing about technology. And I think Belgrade here, what I've seen is I mean, the, what you guys have done in early years with even in your PhD time was just amazing, groundbreaking work actually. And then of course, never forget the transfer into the clinical or the home setting. So talking and having a doctor on board, having therapists on board is absolutely vital. Otherwise it's never going to happen. So with this, I think I'm gonna skip these next ones because these are just something I was going to throw in for well, future. Th but now, special thanks to these guys, because we, I think the three of us, uh, well, the four of us, in fact, were the ones who enabled us to bring this kind of intervention into the real clinical setting, which is now being used in Denmark. And uh, without these people, so this is, this is of course, Dario from England now, uh, Ning Yang that I didn't introduce from Canada. He's an excellent signal processor, of course, Professor Kostic, who allowed this first study, I think a really special thanks go to these people, but also I have to thank, of course, the chronic study team, which is of course also Sasha Radovanovich, uh, <laughs> who really planned my time and showed me the best places to go for breakfast here in Belgrade. That was awesome. <laughs> Alexander Pavlovich, uh, who as a doctor did amazing. She found the patients, she did, she did all the clinical assessments, uh, all the analysis of that data it was a really, really help. I forgot Militsa on here, which I'm really sorry about. Ning Yang, of course, and the patients, which were amazing. Just as a by the way thing, when we did this study, I don't know whether you remember, we had flooding. It was the time of the flooding, right? And um, the patients still came, they were amazing. They still came to the lab and they were happy to do so. And uh, I'm just so grateful to them. And of course, we have the, the acute study team or the subacute study team, which is Andrew that you saw, Hela, who's the therapist, Ko, who's the doctor, and of course, Dario Ning and the patients again, and then to some of the funding. And with that, I am going to thank you very much. And again, for the invitation, and I will conclude. Melanie, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.